So we've had that Australian focus now. We're going to zoom out again and end to look at a little bit of um, regulation and innovation. If you're tuning in now, uh, my name is Amy Rose. I'm the Head of Operations at Blockchain Australia. This is day four of Blockchain Week. It is the global focus today. We are going across regions, APAC, US, um, Europe, and the Middle East. So up next, and I think our speakers are here, which is excellent on time. Thank you, Stuart and Edward. Um, so up next, we are going to focus on, so building the future is the topic of conversation between Zero Hash and Tasty Trade on building or rebuilding trust in crypto with international regulators and consumers. Gentlemen, I am going to leave you both to chat. Um, if there's any questions in the chat, I will pop them directly into the your speaker's chat box. So keep an eye out for that if there's any time remaining at the end, but totally understand there's, a, there's only a little bit of time and you've got lots to talk about. Um, so if there's not enough time for, for answering some of those questions, that's fine. But I'm going to leave you to it. Thanks so much for coming on board. It's wonderful to see you both. No, thanks for having us. And um, good evening or uh, from Chicago, but uh, good morning, um, Australia. I feel a little bit like uh, Eurovision uh, right now. Uh, but my Cand my colleague Candice is actually um, in person. Um, so excited to do this virtually. Um, so thanks for joining us today, um, you know, with myself and, and Stuart. Um, you know, one of the things I'm really excited about is to today do a little bit more of a deep dive um, with Stuart around zero hashes and trady, tasty trades experiences um, in building crypto products that we think are regulatory robust, trusted by consumers, and importantly, um, globally operational. So Stuart is the COO international at Tasty Trade, and we're going to basically be going through a bit more of a deep dive of some of the learnings that they that they've taken having launched a crypto product. Uh, close to three years ago now, um, in partnership with Zero Hash um, across the world. Um, just to give you a little bit of context about Zero Hash. Zero Hash is a global one stop crypto as a service provider, and we take care of the technological and regulatory um, overhead. So we're a B2B to C API driven business, um, and we cover uh, geographies including the US, Australia, Brazil, um, the UK, and Europe. Um, so it was exciting. We got to know Tasty Trade three years ago, um, and the number one feature that they had on their platform um, prior to launch was access to crypto. And in partnership with Zero Has, Tasty Trade has built and launched this sophisticated and powerful crypto um, offering. So without further ado, um, you're not going to hear much of me today, um, is uh, Stuart. Um, so thanks for joining us. Uh, Stuart, it'd be great to kind of maybe, you know, focus firstly on the opportunity that Tasty Trade saw in entering the market, given that Tasty Trade was probably the first major global brokerage firm to offer crypto trading. Um, I'm curious, um, you know, this is not something that we've spoken about recently. Like, why did Tasty Trade embrace crypto early on? I can't seem to hear you, Stuart. Maybe I should switch back to headphones. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. We've got so many different devices going at the same time, so apologies. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks, Edward, for the introduction. Um, Tasty Trade, we've got a, well, the founders of Tasty Trade um, have a pretty long history of innovation in the financial services market. I'm not sure if many people have heard of the, the platform Think or Swim, but that was one of the true um, I guess, incredibly innovative firms that was built sort of 15, 20 years ago in the, in the United States. And, and they were actually the founders of, of Think or Swim as well. We've moved into the Tasty Trade uh, era now. Um, we've always been uh, very uh, aware of challenging our clients. And that's something that I think is really important that, that we, we should never underestimate our clients. And with crypto, we saw a wonderful opportunity to continue that innovation and continue to challenge our clients. We developed a sophisticated trading platform for US derivatives and and uh, and and securities, and the the opportunity we saw with crypto and the demand that we were seeing from our clients trading with us on US exchange traded products was significant. To have a crypto offering 
that was also embedded, that was part of an overall offering that we provided, that provided a seamless experience for them. They could just flick through without having to log out and log in again and so on and so forth. And it all felt as though it was part of the one, uh, one single environment for them that they were investing in. Um, we did some research, uh, the opportunity was was, was, was evident to us. Um, and obviously then we started to, I guess, look for someone to partner with to that had a similar mindset as us, a similar ethos um, and could see the opportunity, but also wanted to do it the way we wanted to do it. Um, and that was obviously really key in our decision process um, when we were looking for partners. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I think, you know, that, that's kind of a great global um, yeah viewpoint which i know is one of the focuses here but maybe diving into australia obviously tasty has um, a presence in australia um ig that now owns um tasty uh, from last year obviously has a large presence in australia um but you know there wasn't there was a process there was a uh, an intent to launch this product um in australia uh with zero hash i'm curious just diving into the australian market um what, what what kind of do you, what excites you about the australian market in, in crypto and um you know wh why was Australia, one of the geographies that was launched with this product? The Australian market was a, a fairly logical one for us, I think. I mean, if we talk globally for a second again, you know, you're talking about sort of 300 million crypto users and there's a 4 billion opportunity. That's enormous. So whether that ratio is exactly the same in Australia, once we bring it down to the, uh, to, to the population here, who knows? But the Australians have been, in, in, in my opinion, have been fairly uh, early adopters of crypto. Um, we are. We do have an, a, 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 or are considered to be an educated and sophisticated retail investment market here. We aren't. We aren't new to this. Australians have been trading uh, online for decades now. Um, we you know, one of the earliest uh, online options exchanges was was set up through the ASX as well. So new products, new capabilities aren't foreign to us, and 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 we do look for opportunities. Um, the, I think the evolution that, that, that we've seen in stockbroking, being an old stockbroker, so I apologise to lots of people who are probably listening in, I am a stockbroker, um, um, is it's not what, what we're seeing and what we can provide is not dissimilar to what I've seen in the last 20, 25 years within the stockbroking industry, where, where new products come out, um, there are there's significant interest, there is some wariness, there's education required, um, and clients evolve into wanting to have that seamless one-stop shop experience. And that's something that we could provide to Australians here, given our partnership with Zero Hash, that we could provide, as I said earlier, that single platform, that, which is a seamless experience. Um, and now what really, that's sort of what we're starting to see with some evolution in the Australian market uh, as well, where we're seeing stockbroking firms, other stockbroking firms, CFD providers, who are looking to be able to offer crypto uh, cryptocurrencies through that seamless uh, process. There are challenges, I think, still um, that we are obviously probably all all going through on the um, on the regulatory space. But we did feel that Australia, being a fairly mature and reasonable regulatory environment, it was a natural first step for us from an international perspective. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great point. I think we obviously see a lot of data from customers across the world. You know, we have millions of end customers now. Yep. And although, you know, the number of Australian customers is not necessarily, you know, as high for, as a proportion, right? It, it's proportionate yep. roughly, but just the activity um, of these customers is considerably higher. So I think one of the things to be bullish about, you know, in terms of the Australian market is just <laughs> that the activity per capita is just significantly greater than, you know, what we Absolutely. see including right. in the U.S., which is a relatively, I would say, equivalent market for maturity from a, from a trading perspective. Um, I, I do think what's you know interesting and um, is obviously in some ways, Tasty is a veteran in the crypto space. I mean, having launched the product three years ago, and obviously the world has shifted a lot since you launched. Right, you alluded to some of the regulatory commitments and and challenges. I would say, and obviously, twenty twenty two was maybe the you can call it the zenith or potentially the nadir, right? Of 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 what we saw from the regulatory um, issues, you know, caused by, you know, FTS and, and others. I do think it's worth just pointing out just a couple of important data points that I think is quite interesting just to share with the, with the audience. Um, so Zero Hash uh, conducted a, a survey with three thousand customers and consumers across the U.S., Australia, U.K., and Brazil, and what we saw which was pretty interesting, which I think um, actually reinforces the point that you made around, for example, um, you're seeing more CFD providers into the crypto space, 
is that, um, you know, 45% uh, of Australians that are interested in crypto um, are wary of using companies um, that they have no experience with. So I think that kind of embedded experience is actually an even greater opportunity, given the fact that groups are saying, look, we're going to revert to trust. We're still interested in this space, but we want to work with companies and brands that we're familiar with. Um, you know, and, and another key data point is that 95% of Australians surveyed that were interested in crypto uh, wanted to use a financial services consumer brand to engage in crypto. And that the number one decision, the one, number one determinant for making the decision wasn't price, wasn't breadth of product, was all around um, their reputation um, and the group that they're most familiar with. Um, I, I do think, obviously, it's impacted us in different ways. Um, different regulators in different places have responded differently. Obviously, the US has, I would say, the pendulum has swung in, in, in one direction. But actually, in Europe, for example, the pendulum has swung with greater clarity. And even, I would say, you know, even in the UK, for example, um, Richie Sunak has said that they want to, you know, want to create UK as the as the Web three hub of the world. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, what was the impact for you, both in terms of kind of opportunities and challenges um, around some of this news last year, some of the challenges that the space experienced, and if anything, did it differ um, by geographical location? Um, look. I the regulatory component has been the elephant in the room for a long time now. Um, um, and, and I'm sure there's probably been a lot of talk this week um, at this event. Um, you know, I think the biggest issue we've had has been uncertainty. We haven't really had what you'd call a regulatory leader that everyone else has been looking to, to, to set the standard that, that then the various jurisdictions would cherry pick what they wanted to use. Um, um, I think, you know, we all know it's coming um, and, the uncertainty around it has been difficult from a strategy perspective for us, there's no doubt, when we're looking at, at uh, potential places to go into. Um, excuse me, <coughs> sorry. Um, um, I think, yeah, we've seen we've seen some action already in certain jurisdictions. So you mentioned the SEC. There's been some more recent interesting components around that, particularly around capital adequacy for firms, and there's some challenges there. We've seen the MAS, we've seen the SFC, the FCA. They're all starting to go part of the way. It's almost as though they've they've rushed to get to an an initial point, and now they're almost sitting back waiting to see who's going to take the next step and actually, yeah, I guess design a framework that we're going to be able to fall in. Um, I'm not going to you know, from, coming from regulatory perspective anyway, we are obviously licensed in, in, in multiple jurisdictions. We're used to that. A regulatory environment to us is very familiar, but it's also very familiar to the client. And I think that's where you're, you know, you, we're really coming from, from a trust, um, and potentially in, in some cases in, in, in the retail space, I guess, people who are, who are keeping their hands off or have stepped back or waiting um, to see how the framework uh, is designed and how it's implemented. Because at the end of the day, clients want to be able to trade with someone they trust. They want to be able to invest in products, capabilities and use capabilities that they trust and that they're confident in. And when the confidence is shaken, I mean, that can be quite difficult to get back. Once we, you know, First step to that is having adequate regulation, is, is, is enabling the client to understand that they have settlement capabilities, they have custody capabilities, they have rights, they have you know, uh, remedies, um, that there are segregation of fu appropriate funds, et cetera, that, that you know, the company that they are choosing to invest with will be there in the future. And the trusted names really, I think, is, is probably fairly obvious in my mind that the mm -hmm. retail clients would look to those firms because they have established confidence, they have established ethics and morals from a corporate perspective. Um, uh, some arguably can be, you know, can have good days and bad days, as we know, but they are already having to comply with capital adequacy requirements, and there is that confidence that, that they will be around. Um, that then, I, I think, rolls into the type of offering that these entities are looking for. Now, obviously, we know that there's been some discussion by banks in Australia in this space and, and that perhaps um, some of the statistics they're throwing around don't necessarily tell the full story um, around some of the difficulties that, that, that you know, this uh, space has, has seen over the last 12 or 18 months. But that's because they're choosing to drive a narrative. Um, and I think being part of that narrative, rather than sitting back and just listening and hoping it falls our way, your way, um, 
is, is, is really key to getting in there and talking to the regulators and trying to understand and influence where possible. Uh, what we don't want to do is all sit, sit on our hands and wait and then find that something is delivered that's, that's very difficult to work within, very difficult to implement, and has really been driven by the much larger organisations for their benefit, primarily for their benefit. Um, we want to be innovative. We want to be, um, be, to be able to provide the capabilities that our, we believe our clients uh, want to see, but we want to do it in a ethical, regulated, secure way. And, yeah. I, and in my opinion, that's really what we're starting to see from our clients um, is that they're looking for that security, they're looking for that trust, and that's why they're moving to, uh, to firms with known names. Yeah, no, I think that's a really pertinent point. I think, you know, one of the things that has been missed potentially in the US, for example, and I think is often missed in the discussion, obviously, we're talking about, you know, uh, brokerage clients right here in, in the sense of they're, they're, they, they trade equities, they trade options, and now they're trading crypto um, for, for whatever reason, right, as a regulatory head, hedge. But I think one of the important things and what we're really strong believers in is that, you know, crypto um, is a technology, not an asset class, right? It can also be an asset class, but by itself, it's not always an asset class and so you know we serve as clients such as stripe um that is leveraging crypto as a payment method yep. we service some of the large remittance companies and i think if we think about regulation and kind of we opine for example on on a recent um you know a recent piece in, in, in australia and um, that is currently going through parliament um you know what we are really keen to stress is that crypto is a technology right let's not miss this point um it's not just an asset class. I think that, that, that I think that narrative and ensuring that the narrative comes to the fore in terms of how we think about regulation, how we think about approach is, is really, really important. I think just one, you know, there's some people in the audience thinking about, you know, you mentioned some some names and some groups that, you know, are starting to explore crypto. And I think there is actually an even, an even the, there's actually a great time to enter the space as a traditional player. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about kind of the build by partner strategy and kind of how you went through that process? Obviously, um, you know, crypto is still a relatively small percentage of your overall um, product offering, but something that was desired almost kind of table stakes or kind of a differentiator. Can you talk about how you thought about kind of build by partner? Yeah, for us, again, I mean, when we're looking for a service provider, uh, we're looking for someone that, that has the same sort of approach that we do, um, that we are you know, cousins for want of a better term, that you know, in our in our approach to life and what we're trying to trying to do for our clients, um, and when we when we're evaluating those service providers, what I, I think tends to, to to come out is 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 one or two will always step forward and that and they'll almost be seen to be willing to um, become a partner, which is the term you use to actually partner with us and 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 to 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 go on the journey together and and seek to jointly I guess explore the capabilities that we're looking to offer and what may then potentially come from those. So it's for us, it's, it's really a lot about, um, I guess, flexibility, speed to market, um, ease of um, uh, integration, um, connection, integration, et cetera. Um, we, we, we are not a fly by the seat of our pants sort of firm. We do uh, go into detail when we are looking at people that we're going to <clears throat> going to partner with and given the fact that we are licensed it is extremely important from a reputational perspective not only with our clients but with the with the regulator that we are partnering with people who have a similar mindset um, when it comes to regulation in this space um, I, I think when, when we looked at you and your team Edward Zero Hash it was fairly fairly evident early on that you were probably ahead of the curve when it came to you know, we're not going to just be able to do whatever we want for as long as we want. That the, the, the you know, regulation is going to come in in some shape or form, um, and the fact that we were able to build partner with you and and, and build our product in such a way um, that 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 you know, clients clients uh, feel protected, they feel looked after, they feel confident, they feel the trust in the capabilities that we're providing them, and given that we are already a regulated entity, it 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 it, it allows our clients to have confidence and, and comfort with what we're providing them. Um, yeah. I, I mentioned, I guess, speed to market as well. And that was key for us. We, we're innov innovators. We needed to get out there. We saw the opportunity and the ability to connect with you and the capabilities you had, pace was key, was really, really important to us as well. 
you know, absolutely. I'm just uh, going to pick up this question up um, in, in a second from Kate. But I think it might be helpful to talk to some of the challenges. I know that one of the themes um, at the conference over the last day or so has been, there's been a lot of talk around fraud, right? And this is one of the, the focuses. Um, I think it'd be interesting to kind of hear a little bit more of your thoughts on that if you can. But, you know, I think one thing that people often miss is, one, as a traditional player entering the space, um, you're really just offering your existing customers um, an additional service. So you have a lot of information on these customers already, which radically reduces the risk profile. I think also the second thing is that there is an approach that you can take around, um, you know, cruel walk run um, and how that impacts fraud, right? So the highest chance of fraud exists when you enable withdrawals. Right, because you effectively enable the the assets to go, you can never get those assets back. There's a chargeback or on the credit card or debit card or some alternative funding mechanism. So I think those two points actually place traditional players in a, in, in a better place. But maybe you can talk if if you can about just fraud generally or fraud related to crypto. Maybe you know maybe this is something you don't think too much about because of those two points that I just mentioned. But just given that it yeah. is one of the things of the conference, great to get your thoughts. Yeah, I think look, look, I think. We're probably in a pretty good place when it comes to that because, as you mentioned, I mean, we do full KYC. We have KYC and AML overlaid on top of our clients because in order to trade crypto with us, they are opening up a stock and derivative trading product anyway. So we're already already in our regulatory environment having to comply with broad regulations around that. Um, yeah, we do limit the ability for clients to to fund in certain ways. Um, so, so, you know, the fact that with the, in our model, we have a clearing and custodial firm as well that isn't the crypto firm that then interacts with, with zero hash. So when clients are wanting to deposit and, and, and uh, deposit funds and withdraw funds, they're actually coming through the, the, the brokerage firm. They're coming through the regulated, regulated entity, entity to do yep. that. Um, and that allows us to get ahead, I think, of potential well, you can never say never, of course, but we're ahead ahead of a, a lot of the opportunists out there that we are putting a lot of picket fences up in front of them in order to try and you know defraud our clients of 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 their hard earned money. Um, um, and you know, I, I think that's part of it in in this industry, or even if in in your own home, is that I, I guess you, you you can't you can't guarantee that it's not going to happen. But if you put up enough enough picket fences, then those uh, People are going to move on to the next, hopefully more vulnerable target, rather than rather than try to tr try yeah. to come at you and your clients. Um, I think we've got a lot of picket fences up, given the model that we've implemented and how we're operating it at the moment. Yeah, no, that tends to be the when you talk to folks about fraud. I mean, it, it typically you know it's kind of whack a mole, and if you can make it yeah. higher challenging, it effectively fraud. It's almost like um, it's almost non-linear how, how those things occur. Um, maybe kind of just for final question. Um, which is kind of turned to the future. I mean, look, people, some people sometimes you'll use the term crypto winter, but it's kind of odd to use the term crypto winter when Bitcoin's, you know, above 30,000. Um, we saw a big rally in BCH, for example, yesterday. I mean, but I think one of the nice things when people talk about crypto winter or, or whatever is that it's actually now become somewhat decoupled from price, which I think is shows the evolution of this space. But let's just say that we're moving towards maybe a crypto spring or, or that we hopefully we'll get to a crypto spring like what excites you about this space whether it be web3 your product offering regulatory clarity like it'd be great to kind of hear some, maybe there's been a lot of negativity it'd be great to kind of hear maybe just a, a little bit of positivity yeah. i think it's a i think it's sort of sort of all of the above like it, it, it's a very exciting space and it's incredibly early still um I said I'm an old stockbroker, so it's moving very quickly for an old guy like myself. Um, but I think you know the, the continued development of capability and and rapid growth in in the utility and the use um, for blockchain blockchain applications is is astounding. Um, um, yes, we need regulatory clarity. I believe that will come. I believe it will come. How? What is it going to look like? I'm not sure, you know, is there going to be a licensing regime? Is it going to be a broad one in Australia specifically? Is it going to be a separate license or is it going to be part of your current AFSL? I mean, we hold an AFSL, we hold license in other countries. I'd like it just to be an add-on. Um, it'll be less work for me, probably less work for the regulators as well. But all of that's going to going to slowly, I think, come forth. And, and there are some, I mean, if you look at the MAS, if you look at the SF, SFC in Hong Kong, they are taking more steps. The, the licensing regimes are slowly coming in. They just need to mature, I think. Um, 
what I'm not looking forward to is if regulators sort of use blunt force, that they, they try to use existing rules um, to, to enforce a form of regulation in the industry, which um, you know, really then, I guess the only way you would do that is by enforcement. I think that would be really short-sighted. I'm hoping yeah. that the regulators aren't. I don't think they will do that. But again, that's part of grabbing hold of the narrative. And I'll reiterate, it's, it's, we've got to get hold of the narrative with a lot of these discussions with the regulators. Um, um, yeah, the, we're seeing mature financial institutions globally start to integrate this, start to look at the capabilities. I, I really yeah. think there's global opportunity. Um, and if you think about you know, wh where we come from 20 years ago from the, the founding, um, and, and the, the think or swim and the tasty trade and the level of innovation that we've got, um, the reach and impact of crypto and Web3, it, it just it eclipses anything that we've been ex you know, used to or experienced in my career. Um, where does it stop? I don't, I, I don't know. And, and, and I use the old catchphrase, and I've probably used it a few times in my career is like it's a really great time to be in the industry it's a it's like it's full of opportunity at the moment and yes there are some difficulties but there's been difficulties you know my entire career we you know we've had new products new capabilities new regulation new licensing regimes this is something that we just have to weather the storm and get through we will come out the other side and i think it's going to be a fabulous dawn um, um, for anyone who is approaching this in a mature thoughtful strategic way yeah. Not with blinkers on, an open yeah, mind. No, I think one of the interesting things, maybe just, you know, the founding story, you mentioned think or swim, right? I mean, um, people have become, you know, people who are quite um, bullish on, on the space have tended to be early technological um, adopters anyway, right? So if you look yep. at, for example, interactive brokers, Thomas Pedafee was effectively the first electronic market maker ever. Um, yep. or, um, and, you know, they moved into crypto um, last year and, or even before then. Um, Tasty, for example, Tom Sosnoff um, and, and the rest of the team were one of the first people to move <laughs> away from the pits, the electronification of markets. Correct. Yep. And so I think a lot of people see some, some parallels when they were first adopters in terms of something that we now take to be standard, right, which is electronic markets, um, is the same kind of disruption, the same kind of opportunity that they see there. Um, and it's I capability, think... Edward. I mean, that's what I say. It's it's yeah. it's it, it, it's a product. It's like it's capability. It's it's empowering clients to take control of their investments, whatever they may be. Or, you know, it, it is the giving them the capability, challenging them. They will they will stand up. They will step up. And as I said when I started, don't yeah. underestimate your clients because as soon as you do, you're selling them short, and they'll go somewhere else. That's a great place to end, um, Stuart. Where where can people find you if if they want to learn more about Tasty Trader yourself? Sure, um, tastytrade.au or tastytrade.com. Have a look Perfect. at us, send us an email, and um, I'm happy to happy to engage. Awesome, we're right on time. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us today. That was fantastic. Um, I, I look that, like you say, that this past week there has been quite a deep dive into that. Um, I guess that fraud and the risk and and obviously that's our focus here in Australia at the moment. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. We're off to a break now. It's been wonderful to have you and we hope to have you back next year. Thanks Absolutely. a lot. Absolutely, we'll be. Cheers. Gentlemen.